Greetings, this is Greg. Let's have a look at and discuss some of the interesting technical aspects of the Grumman F4F Wildcat. This particular Wildcat is in the terminal at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, and it's been configured to represent Medal of Honor winner Butch O'Hare's airplane. In my opinion, the Wildcat is the unsung hero of U.S. World War II naval fighters. It's largely overshadowed by the later and more powerful Hellcats and Corsairs. However, during the critical early years of the war, it was the Wildcat that was there. The Wildcats fought at the battles of Coral Sea, Midway, Guadalcanal, and others. It could be argued that by the time the U.S. brought in the newer naval fighters, the course of the war had largely been determined. The Wildcat had already done a lot of the heavy lifting in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese while they were still at their best. Most people think the F4F Wildcats were entirely replaced by F6F Hellcats, and on the fleet carriers, the big carriers, they were. However, the Navy couldn't fully phase out the older Wildcats entirely because the newer fighters couldn't operate from the small escort carriers in use by the U.S. Navy. Escort carriers were a big part of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. They built 50 of them in the Casablanca class alone, like the USS Guadalcanal shown here. Compared with the Japanese Zero, the Wildcat didn't have the climb rate or maneuverability of the enemy fighter. However, in many other ways, it was just as good or even better. Once U.S. pilots adapted tactics to take advantage of the Wildcat's strengths, it became very competitive and usually came out on the winning side of the battle. Compared with the Zero, the Wildcat was more rugged, its guns were more suited to shooting down fighters, and it could easily outdive the Zero. The Wildcat also had a much more advanced supercharging system for its engine. The engine is the Pratt & Whitney R1830. It has 14 cylinders, air-cooled, and displaces 1,830 cubic inches. It puts out 1,200 horsepower at 2,700 RPM and over 2,300 pound-feet of torque. The engine spins a constant speed propeller like most World War II fighters, but the Wildcat was one of the first fighter planes so equipped. Its supercharging system has two stages of mechanically driven centrifugal compressors. The system is multi-speed and intercooled. At the time of the Wildcat's debut, its supercharging system with the dual stages was the most advanced mechanically driven system in the world. No operational IJN, Luftwaffe, RAF, or Royal Navy fighter had a dual stage intercooled system until much later. So while we tend to think of the Wildcat as a simplistic early war fighter, it was actually pretty advanced by 1940 standards. Let's take a look at the front of the airplane. As already mentioned, we have two stages of supercharging, which means we have two superchargers. They're called the main blower and auxiliary blower. I don't like the term auxiliary blower because it implies that it's not really important, but in this case, it is, as we'll see. The air inlet at the top of the cowling is an intake for the auxiliary blower. It's a ram air design, which simply means that the forward motion of the plane and the thrust from the propeller literally ram the air into the intake. Nearly all World War II fighters have ram air to improve engine performance. There are two other inlets visible at roughly the 4 and 8 o'clock position. These are dual purpose inlets. They feed cooling air to the intercoolers and when the aux blower is not in use they provide ram air to the main blower. All this will make more sense as we get farther into the supercharging system. Automotive folks may look at those intercooler inlets and think they're pretty small for a 1200 horsepower engine. However, that's not really true. Even on a car, the intercooler inlets only need to be about one quarter the size of the intercooler frontal area. Making them larger doesn't necessarily mean the intercooler will be more effective. And on a faster moving airplane, they can be even smaller. These are about one sixth of the intercooler's frontal area. Let's move around to the side of the plane and look into the wheel well. Here we can see the left side intercooler. It's a simple air-to-air -air unit, much like what you would find on a typical modern turbocharged automobile. The Wildcat has two of them, one on each side, 
I don't think it's supposed to be painted over, but this isn't an operational airplane, so it's no big deal either way. Paint will reduce the effectiveness of the intercooler a little bit, although maybe this was done on naval aircraft for corrosion protection, I'm not sure. Moving to the other side, we can see the right side intercooler. Notice the bulge in the cowling. That's there to provide clearance for the intercooler. I'm not sure what happened here, but it looks to me like the guy responsible for landing gear design wasn't communicating with the guy in charge of intercooler design. This sort of thing does happen. It's also possible that they originally had a different intercooler selected, perhaps with a curved core, and then economic or production realities prevented them from using it. I'm not sure what happened here. There's probably a long lost but interesting story. Here is the official diagram of the supercharging system. I'll walk you through it. There are two superchargers labeled main blower and auxiliary blower. These are centrifugal type superchargers. Centrifugals were the dominant type of compressor on nearly all World War II combat aircraft. The main blower is connected directly to the engine and if the engine is spinning, the main blower is spinning. It cannot be shut off. Below 4,700 feet, the main blower will normally be the only blower providing any boost. It gives just under 7 pounds of boost at sea level, or about 44 inches of manifold pressure. I've added some lines for you. At low altitudes, air enters through the lower ducts we saw earlier and is directed to the carburetor. From there, air is mixed with fuel, and then the fuel and the air go through the main supercharger. Now, in the modern world, sending fuel through a centrifugal compressor is quite unusual. In fact, it's usually frowned upon. However, the engineers back then did know what they were doing. This supercharger has a maximum speed of just under 22,000 RPM, which is really slow by centrifugal supercharger standards. And it's heavily made, so erosion of the impeller wasn't really a concern. Note at this point the aux blower is doing nothing, and neither are the intercoolers. The real fun begins with the aux blower. The aux blower is pilot controlled and has three positions. Below 4,700 feet it would usually be a neutral, which means it's off. Above that altitude, the aux blower can be engaged. From 4,700 feet up to about 13,900 feet, we can run the aux blower in low and have up to 46 inches of manifold pressure. And above 13,900 feet, we can run it in high with a limit of 46.5 inches of manifold pressure. Let's change the diagram here to get a better idea of what's going on. When the aux blower is in use, all air to be mixed with fuel enters through the upper cowl inlet. The air passes through the aux blower then it's cooled by the intercoolers. The intercoolers are kept cool by air flowing through them from the two lower cowl scoops we talked about earlier. From there, it goes through the carburetor and then it's further boosted in pressure by the main supercharger, hence two stages of supercharging. This supercharging and intercooling system allowed the Wildcat's R1830 engine to significantly outperform its Japanese equivalent the engine, not necessarily the airplane. Let's talk about that just for a few minutes. The F4F-3's main adversary was the A6M2-0. The Zero was powered by the Nakajima Sake engine, which was very similar to the R1830 except for the supercharging system. The Sake engine displaced 1700 cubic inches, so that's pretty close to 1830. However, it only had a single supercharger, and early versions only had a single supercharger speed. It was limited to 38 inches of manifold pressure versus the R1830's 46.5. Furthermore, the R1830 could maintain more manifold pressure throughout most of its range, or throughout more of its range, I should say, of operational altitudes. Later versions of the Sake engine had a single stage supercharger but with two available speeds. Now let's take a look at the Wildcat's power graph. Notice that just because your engine is rated at 1200 horsepower doesn't mean it always has 1200 horsepower. In fact, it usually doesn't. Here's a red line to help. 
The red line here shows the range where it does have 1,200 horsepower, which is from sea level up to about 4,700 feet. At that point, the pilot will have to pull the throttle back a bit to avoid overboost when he engages the aux blower into low speed. Now he'll have about 1,040 to 1,060 horsepower available up to about 12,000 feet. Next, he'll pull the throttle back a bit again, put the aux blower into high. At this point, he'll have about 980 to 1,000 horsepower from 13,800 all the way up to about 19,000 feet. This system gives the majority, gives, correction, gives the Wildcat the majority of its power up to an altitude that's fairly high for a naval fighter circa 1940. Sadly, we only have fragments of data for the early war zeros. Here in blue are the power numbers for the A6M20, and these are the only two actual data points I have for this airplane to work off of. It has 940 horsepower at sea level and 950 at 13,800 feet. It's a certainty that power drops off after 13,800. So here is my estimate of what the power curve probably looked like for an A6M2. This isn't perfect, but it's darn close. Notice that the A6M2 supercharger speed is optimized for power at about 14,000 feet which is right where the Wildcat is at a low point. So that's about the worst altitude for a Wildcat pilot to engage in a sustained dogfight with a Zero. The last chart we'll look at is manifold pressure, since the whole point of this supercharging system is to deliver higher manifold pressure up to a relatively high altitude. The main supercharger provides 44 inches of manifold pressure throughout most of its operating range. The aux low setting allows for 46 inches and the aux high 46.5. Notice that the supercharger is able to maintain its max allowable pressure through a fairly wide range of altitudes. Now all of these numbers are with 100 octane fuel, which was pretty standard early in the war. Notice the low boost points, which also correspond to the low power points on the previous chart. They're caused by the need to reduce power prior to engaging the aux blower um, and speeding it up to its next speed. A really careful pilot could avoid these low points and probably did so in combat, so in actuality, the manifold pressure values probably looked more like this. Let's take a look at some of the other features of the plane. The Wildcat is much heavier than the A6M20, in fact, it's about 59% or 2,100 pounds heavier. Worse, that's based on empty weights. The zero burns less fuel, so the longer the mission length, the greater the required fuel and the greater the zero's weight advantage. Although the Wildcat's engine has more power, it's generally not enough to close the gap in performance due to the weights involved. The Wildcat could outdive the zero, in initial acceleration during a dive, the two planes were pretty comparable, but above 350 miles per hour, the Zero became very difficult to control, and the Zero has a never exceed speed of 410 miles per hour, which is far less than the Wildcats. That's fairly low by World War II fighter standards. In terms of the Wildcat, it, it doesn't even have an actual never exceed airspeed because even pointed straight down, the plane is so chunky, its terminal velocity isn't fast enough to damage the airframe. In these conditions, it has a theoretical maximum dive speed of 547 miles per hour, which is just screaming fast. The fact that it can survive that speed shows how rugged the airframe is. Thus, the Wildcat can easily pull away from the Zero in a dive, and it's far more controllable while doing it. The Wildcat systems, other than the engine, are quite simple. The landing gear is operated by a manual crank. Moving around to the tail, we can see that although it's an all-metal airplane, or considered an all-metal airplane, the control surfaces are fabric-covered. That was quite common on World War II aircraft, and that continued right up to the jet age. These tabs I have circled are trim tabs. The pilot can position them from the cockpit to relieve control pressure. This is important because at different speeds and loading conditions, different elevator positions and rudder positions would be needed to maintain level flight. 
it would be very difficult or impossible to use enough force to control the plane under all conditions without trim tabs. And that's not an exaggeration. Planes have crashed due to trim tab failures. In fact, a few years ago at Reno, a P-51 crashed due to exactly this. It's very important to pilots for pilots to uh, check these trim tabs on pre-flight inspections. The left aileron has a trim tab, which is useful, especially if the twin wing mounted drop tanks are installed, because fuel could be burned out of those one at a time, hence the plane in those conditions would always be a little bit out of balance laterally, so having aileron trim for a long flight with drop tanks was really nice. On the right wing, we have a trim tab, which is not cockpit controllable, but can be bent to mechanically trim the ailerons. This is used after the plane is first built and test flown because no two wings or sets of ailerons are going to be rigged perfectly. And this is how that unbalance was adjusted out. This is very typical in aircraft. It's also useful in setting the plane right after it's had wing damage repaired, which of course is important in a warplane. In this picture, you can see the flaps. They're the, flip, they're the split flap design that was very common on World War II fighters. This design is simple, gives a lot of lift, uh, but also gives a huge amount of drag. In the Wildcat, they're powered by the engine manifold vacuum. A vacuum reservoir was installed aft of the cockpit so that in the event the throttle was open and the engine was on boost, thus manifold pressure wouldn't be available, they would still be able to move the flaps to the selected position because of the reservoir. This system is very simple. It's essentially idiot-proof. Like the airframe, you can't damage these flaps by overspeeding them because if you do overspeed them, the air loads on the flap will overcome the vacuum in the actuating system and they'll simply be forced back up into the, into the up position. Even better, they'll be forced up in a nice linear fashion, so you won't find yourself suddenly sinking. I don't know of any other airplane that's so impervious to overspeed. Even the twin external drop tanks don't have a speed limit on this thing. The only system that can be damaged by overspeed is the engine. It's possible to windmill the propeller so fast in a dive that it suffers damage. However, even the engine has an allowance for that. The normal red line is 2700 RPM, but in a dive when, wind when windmilling, it's allowed to go to 3050. Back to the airframe, notice the position of the wing. It's mounted pretty high on the fuselage near the midpoint. This makes it pretty easy to quickly distinguish the Wildcat from the later F6F Hellcat. The two planes look similar, but the Hellcat's wings are mounted fairly low on the fuselage. If you're flying for the Japanese side in an online sim, telling these two planes apart is a big deal. They're totally different airplanes with very different capabilities. Back to the Wildcat. Here we can see the cowl flaps. These are manually operated by the pilot via a hand crank and are the primary means of regulating cooling air over the air-cooled engine. When fully open, they create a lot of drag and cost about 15 miles per hour in airspeed. Typically, you'll see them fully open on the ground, closed up at higher speeds. In period photos of Wildcats in flight, you'll see them in various positions. In this picture, you can see the cowl flaps on the other side of the wheel well. Operation of the landing gear via the hand crank is simple but not trivial. It takes about 28 full turns or about 30 seconds of furious flailing about to raise or lower the landing gear, and apparently that crank gets really hard to turn towards the end of its travel, and the flight manual warns against assuming that the gear is all the way up or all the way down until you are sure that handle has reached the stop. Here's the left wing. The scoop underneath is an air inlet for one of the two engine oil coolers. The other is in the right wing. The two rectangular slots under the wing are for ejected cartridges from the machine guns. In the F4F-3 seen here, we have two Browning 50 caliber machine guns in each wing, four total. This configuration is used in the F4F-3 Wildcat and the later FM2 variant, which we'll get to. They fired about 800 rounds per minute each, 
Ammo loads vary, but around 450 rounds per gun was a common configuration, a little less for the inboards. The guns could be selected to fire one of three ways, either both left guns, both right guns, or all four, at least in the FM2 variant. The F4F-3 manual doesn't state this specifically, but the switches are arranged the same way in both types. There is a door on the right side of the airframe. Uh, it's labeled radio battery, and that's exactly what's in there. Actually, there are three things in there, the radio, the battery, and the remote indicating compass transmitter. Additionally, there's space in there for a small duffel bag, so it doubles as a baggage compartment. The flaps are extended in this picture. They're typically used for landing, and they can be used to shorten takeoff runs. They only have two positions, up or down. However, if left down, they'll be forced up a certain amount depending on the air load, which we talked about. So in a sense, they have infinite positions within a certain range, but are not intended to be used that way. It's just a feature of the idiot-proof design. The right wing is much like the left, but here we can see the gun camera window. Now let's talk about the other variants of this airplane. First, we have the F4F-4. That's just like the F4F-3, however, it has six guns, three in each wing, although with quite a bit less ammo per gun. This configuration proved to be unpopular during the ex due to the extra weight, and many of these were converted back to the four-gun configurations. The Dash 4 model also has folding wings, which can be seen here. The earlier Dash 3 model did not. The big change came with the FM2 Wildcat, often called the Wilder Wildcat. It was, a light, it was lighter, had a slightly taller vertical stabilizer, it could carry bombs, later it could carry rockets. It had a different but similar engine, another air-cooled radial, with a little more power. And actually that power part is complicated, but we'll get to that in a minute. The FM-2 was late to the party and showed up at about the same time as the far superior F-6F Hellcat. However, again, because the Hellcat was unsuitable for operations on escort carriers, the FM-2 stayed in production until the end of the war. FM-2s are easily recognizable by their different exhaust configurations. The big change in the FM-2 was the switch from the 1200-horse Pratt & Whitney engine to the 1350 horse Wright Cyclone 1820. The two engines were about the same in displacement, although the Cyclone was a nine cylinder instead of 14. The Cyclone had a single supercharger with two speeds. So, well, wait a minute here. The Pratt & Whitney has two superchargers, one of which has two speeds. So that has to be better, right? Why does the Cyclone with its single supercharger have more power? Well, there are a few reasons. First, the Cyclone runs a little more boost, meaning it has more manifold pressure. This was allowable because it was set up for 130 octane fuel. Second, when they were designing the original Wildcat, nobody really knew what naval carrier warfare was going to look like, so the original Wildcat supercharger configuration had to provide power through a wide range of altitudes. But by the time the FM-2 came along, not only had there been some advancements in technology to take advantage of, but now they knew where the fighting was taking place, and they biased the FM-2 for those altitudes. Then they added in water injection to the FM-2 to get even more out of it. So it's not that the Cyclone was a better engine. Both were quite good. But the Cyclone was put onto the airframe later when 130 octane fuel and water injection were available. Let's look at a power chart for the FM2 and compare it to the earlier model. The first thing I notice is nowhere on this chart does the engine put out that 1350 horsepower. In fact, that horsepower number isn't anywhere in the official pilot's handbook. According to this official chart, at military power, the engine puts out about 1260 horsepower at sea level and peaks at about 1,300 horsepower at about 3,500 feet, and from there it starts to drop off. So what gives? Well, this chart gives us power numbers without the water injection spraying. Now we'll get back to this. Let's move on and compare the power numbers in this set, in this configuration, to the older Wildcat with the Pratt & Whitney. 
The orange line shows the FM2's cyclone engine with the supercharger in low speed. The blue lines show the Pratt & Whitney uh, power with the aux blower in neutral and then the aux blower in low speed. The cyclone's extra manifold pressure give it more power all the time below 10,000 feet, even without the water injection. Now at 10,000 feet, the Pratt & Whitney catches up. At 13,000 feet, the pilot with the cyclone engine will put the blower into high. The cyclone will now be pretty close in power, but as the aircraft climb, the Pratt & Whitney will gain further advantage from its multi-speed two-stage system. So while the cyclone is more powerful, it's not always more powerful. The Pratt supercharging system is more advanced, but the benefits only come into play at fairly high altitudes where combat would rarely take place with these airplanes. Now let's take a brief look at the water injection system. Water injection is a pretty big deal. It allows more manifold pressure and thus more power. The FM2 has 10 minutes worth of water and can run the system for five minutes continuously. With the water on, when the supercharger is in low, manifold pressure will increase from the normal maximum of 46 inches up to a maximum of 50 inches. The actual amount of increase is variable and determined by a regulator. The manual states that at sea level there will be little difference, so by that I suspect it only goes to 47 or 48 inches. When it does go to the full 50 inches, it gives an increase in power of about 8%. So that makes that 1,350 horsepower number that's published easily attainable up to about 5,000 feet. Now with the blower in high speed, normal military power is limited to about 43 inches. But with the water injection spring, it can go up to 52 inches. That's a really big change and it's going to give somewhere from 15 to 20 percent more horsepower. So that's why water injection is awesome. Now compared with the Pratt & Whitney engine, the nine-cylinder single-row right engine was lighter but not much. The dry weights are within about a hundred pounds of each other. Overall the FM2 variant, in other words the entire aircraft, was about 300 pounds lighter than the F4F-3 which is part of what contributed to its superior performance. The Wildcat, in all its variants, served the U.S. Navy very well through the entire war. It was a pretty advanced aircraft when it debuted, and it paved the way for the later Hellcat. Even though the Hellcat was superior in most regards, the Wildcat soldiered on because, again, the Hellcat just couldn't operate effectively from those escort carriers, and neither could the Corsairs. Interestingly, once Grumman's Bearcat was on the scene, due to its very short range, it couldn't fully replace the Hellcat. Thus, the Bearcat ended up being more of a Wildcat replacement. The Bearcat's another story. It's actually really complicated. I'll talk about it when I get into the U.S. Navy super props in another video. It should be noted that the Wildcats served in the Royal Navy as well, although those were tamed versions without the dual-stage intercooled supercharging system. They were called Martlets. Now later the Royal Navy did have FM2s, which they called Wildcat 6s. This is a great picture from Life magazine. That's an F4F-3 Wildcat, and the man on the right is Jim Thatch, who was instrumental in developing tactics for the Wildcat. He survived the war and became an admiral. The man on the left is Butch O'Hare. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Goodbye.